I have traveled o'er many a mile, a many a sight I've seen, but none there are that can compare with my own dear island green. And there's a place that I know well, I think I see it still. It's that little town in County Town, Rough Island. Catherine O'Hare was born on the 23rd of April, 1836, in the townland of Ballybrick, Annaclone, County Down, in the north of Ireland. She was the youngest of nine children. Her parents were Rose Byrne and James O'Hare, a linen weaver. During this time, weaving and spinning were the main occupations of many rural men and women outside of farming the land. When Catherine was four years old, the O'Hares moved to Castle Street in nearby Rathryland in the foothills of the beautiful Mourne Mountains. At the time, Rathryland was a thriving market town with a population of over 2,100 people and the O'Hares soon established their cottage weaving industry. In 1845, life changed dramatically when a potato blight hit Ireland, bringing years of famine and disease. Potatoes were the main source of food for most Irish people, and times were hard. Many relied on government soup kitchens to survive. It is believed that between 500,000 and 1 million people died of illness and hunger due to the famine. Another million lost their homes, and many left Ireland for Great Britain, the United States of America, Canada or Australia. The famine ended in 1849 and so did the O'Hare's means of livelihood as rural weaving could no longer compete with factory processes. Emigration to North America continued to rise even after the famine as tales of the good life in the New World came across the Atlantic Ocean in letters. These tales, possibly from her own emigrant siblings, led a 16-year-old Catherine to follow in the footsteps of so many other Irish girls and emigrate to the United States of America. In preparation for her new life and home, Catherine took a course in domestic work, which was being offered by the government to help young girls find work in the new world. There she was taught not only household duties, but also cooking and baking. Aged 16 and full of hope and promise, Catherine left Ireland to make her new life in America. According to newspapers from the time, Irish girls were hard workers and pleasant to have around, and were high in demand. It remains unclear where Catherine began her journey, if she stopped in England, or if she travelled with someone. What is known is that she arrived in Boston, Massachusetts in 1851. The journey to America was long and often unpleasant. It could take eight weeks with good sailing conditions and up to 16 weeks if the weather wasn't favourable. The migrants travelled in ships designed to carry timber from the New World that returned with human cargo. 200 passengers travelled in the lower deck, making for very crowded, noisy and unpleasant conditions. They also had to share bunk beds with three or four other people, including strangers if they were not travelling with family members. Blankets were also shared, as well as infections and diseases as a result. Passengers were allowed 30 minutes in the upper deck once a week and had to contend with sleep deprivation, constant noise, boredom, frustration, fear and discomfort, as well as with the stench coming from below the bunk beds, where buckets were placed and used as toilets. These were emptied once or twice a day. Diseases such as typhus spread quickly and easily. Records show that in the late 1840s, one in four passengers would either die on the journey or on arrival. Catherine survived the journey, but like other passengers, she had to be quarantined upon arrival in Boston. After passing her medical test, Catherine found work as a maid with a family in Springfield, Massachusetts. 
The family she worked for was wealthy and generously let her use their large library to teach herself how to read. Life was good in Springfield and Catherine was amazed by the thriving and bright town. The gaslight all around her was a stark difference to the way she had lived in Ireland by candlelight only. In 1854, three years after she landed in America, Augustus Schubert, a young bearded carpenter, came to her home to fix the steps of the stairs. Originally from Germany, Augustus was 31 years old when he began to court a 19-year-old Catherine. He had arrived from Germany 10 years before and constantly spoke about seeking his fortune elsewhere, mainly St Paul in Minnesota which was an important trading post for furs, groceries and dry goods. A year later, probably after her contract to pay the ship fare was completed, Catherine and Augustus married and moved to St Paul, the first of many moves the couple would make during their life together. Now Mrs Schubert, Catherine found St Paul a town of rapid growth. It was surrounded by nature, and it was there that she first encountered the native population. Within a short time, the Schuberts were making a profitable living, with Catherine running a grocery store and Augustus working as a carpenter. In 1856, a year after arriving in St Paul, the Schuberts welcomed their first child, Augustus, and two years later, their second child, Mary Jane. Life was settled, but not always smooth. The Schuberts lived in fear of raids by the native population, who were discontent with the way the United States government was handling their land sales. There was also a great deal of tension in the air because of an economic depression which caused Augustus and many others to lose their jobs. During this time, news arrived of gold being found in New Caledonia, northwest in present-day British Columbia. It was believed to be an even bigger strike than the one in California in 1849. After hearing favourable reports from a fur trader about a place called Fort Garry, now Winnipeg, the Schuberts decided to move there. At midnight on December the 28th, 1858, the Schuberts and other families covered themselves in buffalo robes and left St Paul in sleighs. After 560 miles of bitterly cold winds, trackless prairies and several stops for refreshment and rest, they arrived in Fort Garry. The Schuberts crossed the river and settled in St Boniface. It would not take long for them to start making a living from farming and storekeeping. In 1860, they welcomed another son, Jimmy. Catherine had a positive relationship with the native population in St Boniface. She found them friendly and often purchased goods from them. This may have been due to the fact that the native population there were not yet experiencing much of the injustices that their American counterparts were. Settled life in St Boniface would not last long. The family faced a harsh winter in 1861 followed by a spring thaw that brought a devastating flood, causing the Schuberts to lose everything. They could no longer remain immune to the growing gold fever in the area, which was a meeting place for expedition groups heading to the gold fields of the Caribou. Augustus decided to join a group going west in search of gold. Catherine did not want her family to be split and decided she and the children would go too. The couple argued about this decision for two days. Augustus was strong-headed and dictatorial, but Catherine immovable. Getting nowhere with Augustus, Catherine decided to speak to the leader of the expedition, Thomas McMicken, who consented to her and her children joining the group. He wrote about it in his diary, saying, Mrs Schubert was equally determined he should not go alone but that the entire family shared the perils of the journey. With McMicken's consent, there was little that Augustus could do. Catherine would be the only woman in a group of 150 men making the overland journey to the Caribou. 
Catherine was five months pregnant at the time and hid it from the group. On the 2nd of June 1862, the Schubert family began their overland journey to the Caribou in high spirits. Little did they know that the trip would soon turn into a nightmare. At their first stop, after two and a half days of travel, the group established some rules. They would travel from 5 until 11 in the morning and then from 2 until 6 in the afternoon. They took a rest day on Sundays, necessary to feed and rest the animals. Their route headed northwest and they would cover over 2,500 miles in four months. The overland route was the cheaper way to reach the Caribou mines, costing under 100 US dollars, almost 3,000 US dollars today. There was a much easier but much more expensive route by the sea, but it was too much for the overlanders tight budget. Although much of the journey was over open grasslands, the group also had to go through swamps, forests and fallen trees, narrow ridges, deep and wide ravines and many hazardous river crossings. The journey was treacherous and the overlanders had to camp in the open air in all weathers, rain, hail or shine, and under the attack from wild animals such as coyotes or clouds of mosquitoes and black flies. They forded creeks and streams up to four feet deep and they also had to build bridges, some of them up to 100 feet long. Cattle and horses were made to swim across the river on many occasions. The men walked with their animals pulling carts over prairies, plains and swamps. The Schuberts carried their supplies on a red river cart pulled by a cow, while Catherine went on horseback, flanked by her two oldest children in panniers. By the time they reached Fort Edmonton, they were more than halfway. Edmonton was, according to McMicking, a large and very dirty establishment. There were reports of gold being found in the rivers near Edmonton, which tempted 25 men in the group to finish their journey there. However, the Schuberts were determined to carry on and get to the Caribou. As they approached the Rocky Mountains, they took advice about the easiest way to cross and traded their carts and oxen for horses. As they crossed the Rockies, the impact of the journey began to take its toll on the group. Fatigue had a huge effect on their temperament and disagreements, petty disputes and quarrels became common occurrences. The group often had to crawl on their hands and knees and crossed rivers countless times. At one point they had to build rafts several times in one day. But steep slopes and river crossings were not the only challenges. Food supplies were running low, the animals were weakening and there was no ammunition left. Stores along the route were exhausted. The group had to forage for thimbleberries and huckleberries before finally having to slaughter their horses to survive. On August the 27th, two months after the beginning of their journey, the group reaches Tet Joan Cache at the far side of the Rockies. There they met the First Nations people who advised them on two routes, one by the dangerous and fast Fraser River, or by land beside the Thompson River, a longer but slightly safer route. The group decided to split and the Schuberts wanted to waste no time. Catherine was seven months pregnant at this time and was keen to reach her destination to safely give birth. However, the group taking the faster but more dangerous Fraser route refused to take her, so the Schuberts joined the 29 men on the Thompson River route. This would be the last leg of the journey, but it would not get any easier. The group had to walk under constant rain, freezing cold temperatures, cut paths and cross bogs. Walking was taking too long, so they built several rafts and alternated between travel by foot and by river. The river's rapids and icy cold water, coupled with hunger, made it exhausting for a pregnant Catherine and her children. For days, their raft floated downstream and they stayed close to the banks so they could look for signs of life and food. Food was scarce, 
but they did manage to find wild rose hips and rose bushes, which reminded Catherine of her native Ireland. In spite of the trials, the group kept cheerful throughout their journey as much as possible. During the breaks, some went fishing and hunting, while others played musical instruments such as clarinets, flutes, violins and a concertina. They also stopped to hear Alexander Fortune's sermons. Having Catherine and her children on the journey likely had a positive impact on the men, keeping them grounded and providing a family for them while they were so far away from home. Before they could make it all the way to the Caribou, the time came for Catherine to have her baby. While travelling down the river, they came across a settlement of Shuswap First Nations peoples at present day Kamloops, and they quickly understood the overlanders cry for help. The Shuswap women kindly helped and looked after Catherine and the children. Catherine's fourth child, Rose Schubert, was born on the 14th of October 1862 with the help of the shoe swap women in a makeshift tent in six inches of snow. She was the first white girl born in the interior of British Columbia. The Schuberts stayed in Kamloops for a year. Augustus worked as a carpenter and Catherine as a cook for the Hudson Bay Company. In 1863, the Schuberts moved to Lillooet, where Augustus commuted to the goldfields, while Catherine taught local children in her front room, due to the lack of schools in the area. As Lillooet was on the road to the Caribou, it didn't take too long for Catherine to find it profitable to provide food and accommodation for those on their way to the goldfields. Four years later, Augustus convinced Catherine to move to Kisnell, almost 200 miles north by the Fraser River. Although Catherine was doing well in Lillooet, she believed it was her duty to be with her husband and keep her family together. The family settled and Catherine put her cooking skills to work, serving meals, baking bread and pastries while Augustus worked away in the gold fields. The Schubert children were also growing, with Gus, Mary Jane and Jimmy sent off to boarding school in Victoria. However, life in Quesnel was not always as nice and quiet as in Lillooet. The nearby gold fields of the Caribou brought starving men looking for food and they would bang on her door for bread. There were constant robberies and Catherine feared for her and her children's safety. After two years there, Catherine had had enough and decided to return to Lillooet. After returning to Lillooet, Catherine reopened the inn and resumed school classes in her front room. She also resumed her demands for a school to be built, but the government continued to reject her requests. The 1870s brought more changes for the Schuberts. Catherine gave birth to two more children, Charles and then Catherine Nora. Her older children began to fly the nest. Gus Jr. worked as a sale clerk in a nearby town. Mary Jane married and moved to the US and then to Winnipeg. Jimmy went to Victoria to train as a carpenter and Rose left to further her education. Augustus continued to come and go from the gold mines, but Catherine received an invitation to become a matron of a school being built in nearby Cash Creek after years of trying to get the government to build one. There she taught domestic science and helped the girls cope with being away from home. From time to time, she would receive news from Augustus, who continued to be absent from her life. She loved her job, but missed her children terribly. Things got tougher for her when she received the devastating news of the death of her eldest daughter, Mary Jane, by tuberculosis. She left behind two children. In 1881, Augustus returned again, swearing his gold fever was over and he managed to convince her to quit her job and move to the Okanagan Valley, British Columbia, to take over a farm. Okanagan Valley was the last stop for the Tuberts, who were now in their 40s and 50s. It didn't take long for Catherine to put her cooking and hospitality skills to work again, and soon travellers were discovering her roadhouse. She also found herself in great demand as a midwife, given her gift for treating illness 
and the lack of doctors in the area. By 1885, she had a school built on her farm and managed to convince the government to send a teacher there, who would later marry her daughter Rose. Augustus continued to mine for gold, leaving her for months at a time. Although Catherine had a busy life in Canada, she never forgot her family back in Ireland. Each month, without fail, she sent them whatever money she could spare. As the years passed, the Schubert family grew and changed. Catherine was kept busy raising two grandchildren, Bert and Rene, who had moved in with her. Augustus seemed to have finally left gold mining behind and settled into farming life, despite the growing rheumatism taking over his body. On the morning of the 28th of July 1908, Augustus died at the age of 84. He had gone out to attend a sick horse in the barn and fallen down the ladder trying to get some hay. Catherine found him lying on the floor in great pain with two broken ribs. She sat by his bed day and night and after a week Augustus passed away. Catherine's children convinced her to move one final time to Armstrong where she lived until her death, keeping busy and continuing to help the local community as always. Catherine passed away on the 18th of July 1918, 10 years after Augustus at the age of 83. News of her death quickly spread through the Okanagan Valley and she had one of the largest funerals ever held in Armstrong. She has since been honoured for her courage on the overland trip and her efforts to provide education for the young. She was the only woman to participate in the overland track of 1862 and quite possibly the only woman ever to make the journey while pregnant and with three small children. No small feat for the woman who would become known as Lady Overlander. Catherine's legacy lives on thanks to the good work of a variety of individuals and organisations in Rathryland and Armstrong. We have developed opportunities and promoted good community relations within the town for over 30 years. Promoting Catherine's legacy is one of many of our activities. We also run family and cultural events, a men's shed, a sensory room for children with special needs and a range of activities in our community hub. We have kept Catherine's story alive in a variety of ways in recent years. One project saw primary school pupils compete to illustrate her journey through visual art and poetry, while another folk got 40 young people to walk in Catherine's footsteps. Wall plaques have been erected in her memory close to the site of her homes both in Ballybrick and Rathryland by the Anna Clone and the Rathryland Historical Societies and Rathryland Women's Institute. There is also a ceramic panel illustrating Catherine's journey on Castle Street where she used to live. The panel was created by artist Eleanor Wheeler in partnership with young people from the town. One of the biggest achievements came on the 13th of July 2015. After months of planning, a sister city town twinning agreement with Armstrong, British Columbia was signed. A number of activities followed afterwards including the visit of 37 of Catherine's direct descendants to Rathryland a year later. Prompted by this visit, a number of songs have been written about Catherine, as well as books, talks and presentations. Both Ralph Ryland and Armstrong have erected road signs detailing the distance between them, and the links between the two places continue going from strength to strength. We still have big plans for Catherine's legacy. We hope to produce an app tracking her journey and to incorporate a replica of a Red River cart filled with the Schubert Rose in our planned community garden. We are also keen on using her story to promote tourism and showcase the area as a gateway to the Mourns. Catherine was a skilled, courageous trailblazer who not only survived but thrived in the new world. With such a rich legacy, we hope to see a dedicated exhibition to her memory in the Ulster American Folk Park in Oma and maybe even a feature-length film produced. Her story teaches us not only that travel broadens our horizons and shatters stereotypes, but also that if you follow your dreams and believe in yourself, anything is possible with determination. It's a long way from the Rockies 
Dureth Ryland on the hill But on that track we'll wander back So listen if you will For courage great It's hard to beat This woman of renown Catherine Schubert Born O'Hare In good old county down Eighteen thirty-five, the year when Catherine saw the day. In Castle Street, Rothfryland, hunger wasn't far away. But she learned to weave the linen, and she learned to bake the bread. And she learned to pick the berries, and the rose hips rich and red. Sixteen years she crossed the sea to far America, survived the awful coffin ships, landed on the quay in Springfield, Massachusetts, found employment as a maid. Read every book around the house wherein she worked and stayed. 